begin um, this morning by inviting you to reflect on a situation that Augustine encountered. Uh, this, is a, this is a real life situation. And uh, I know that you, you read for this class a tiny bit of Augustine. Uh, and you may not feel equipped to impersonate Augustine in responding to this. Um, do your best. Uh, so so um, Ecdesia wants to sell all that she has and give it to the poor. She, this is her understanding of the gospel teaching. And she um, happens to be married. She happens to be wealthy. She happens to have a child. And she comes to Augustine for advice. And actually, that's... I'll, I'll, I'll give you the end of the story at some point, but anyway, that, that's, the, that's the scenario. We will, we'll come back to this, um, but, I'll, but I'll tell you what he said. Um, I think that, that the more complex thing is how he reasoned for it, so I'm not going to say that yet before we kind of unpack Augustine more fully. But he, he re so actually, she, she didn't come to him for advice. <laughs> she just did it. Um, so <laughs> yeah, she just went ahead and did it. And um, then she came to him uh, because her husband was really unhappy. Um, so he did, he did rebuke her. Um, interestingly, he, she had she'd given the, away the family wealth to, to a couple of wandering monks, but the wandering monks were, it was about giving it to the poor. And um, Augustine, interestingly in this case, did not say, um, your husband is the one who gets to make these decisions. <laughs> Somebody might have had that conversation. Um, he said, no, this is the kind of decision that you should make together. You have this, this commitment in marriage, and, and you should be consulting with one another about these decisions. Um, and um, you have a responsibility to your son. So there's a sense of special relationships that carry special responsibilities. And your commitment to, to God does not erase those responsibilities. Yeah, that, well, let, let, let's um, dive in a little bit more here and um, come back to this at the end, hopefully, time permitting. All right, so Christians talk about ethics today because of the Greeks. And as Levin points out, we inherit the very word ethics from the Greeks. So patristic Christians, patristic Christianity in this period in which we, we find Augustine, for example, um, and therefore, all subsequent Christian ethical thought is deeply shaped by Greek uh, ethical reflection. And this was centered around the central Socratic question, how ought I live? And Socrates was famous for having brought philosophy down from the heavens. Right? Pre-Socratic thought, very interested in cosmological questions. And Socrates said, uh, no, we ought to primarily be concerned with living well with practical wisdom. So what is, the le what is, what is the right way to live? And, and so um, Greek ethical reflection is centered around this question. What is the well-lived life? What is the good life? Is it the life that's filled with as much pleasure as possible? Is it the life in which you gain as much honor as possible, where you succeed in being a civic benefactor, where you die violently in battle, uh, in, you know, in defense of some wonderful cause, where you engage in philosophical contemplation? Um, lots of lively debate um, within Greek philosophy about the well-lived or the good life. Now, August, uh, uh, Aristotle, suggested that it was pretty obvious that everyone agreed that the best life was the happy life, the eudaimon life. And he thought, though, the only way that you could really make progress in figuring out what constitutes the truly happy life, or the well-lived life, is by reflecting on human nature. So you got all these people fighting about whether it's honor or pleasure or, or whatever, but it really what you need to do is to think about, well, what kind of thing are we? What kind of being, are we? Um, for each kind of thing, he thought, we can identify what it is to be perfected or fully realized as that kind of thing. And human beings are a kind of animal. Human beings are rational animals. And we can reflect on what we take to be good, what we take to be worthy of pursuit. So human beings can be perfected not just by, let's say, becoming strong or becoming fast or becoming, you know, think about how, how could we be perfected as animals. Um, at, Aristotle thought we have to be perfected also in this capacity to reflect on 
what we take to be good and worthy of pursuit. So this, he thought, happens through the virtues. It, virtues um, are habitual states of character and disposition, and they perfect us in this, in this um, rational animal. It's still, an, it's still an animal capacity, but it's the capacity of a rational animal to order our activity in this way. So our, our end, our telos, is happiness. But happiness is constituted, he says, by perfection of the soul's activity that expresses virtue. So we're being perfected in a particular activity of the soul, and that um, gets expressed through these virtues. So Christian ethics takes over a great deal of this way of thinking about ethics as oriented to both at one and the same time to happiness and to the well-lived life and to being perfected as the kind of creatures that we are. But it also very significantly transforms it, not surprisingly. So one of the, the terms that is threaded through Lovin's treatment of all of this is goal. And I want to quibble a little bit with the way in which he uses goal because I think that sets us off on, uh, on a false track. So Aristotle's concern, as I've just said, is with, the, with what, is being, what is involved in being perfected as a particular kind of thing. That's what the end of that thing is. The, the end of a thing is when it is fully what it is, like fully a rational animal, or fully you know, some other kind of animal, fully the plant that it is. So. And that's very different than having goals, having things that you want to accomplish, having states of affairs that you want to realize. That could be very separable from the way in which you get at those goals. The goal is out here, and like you just want to get that goal. So think about, um, say I have the goal of visiting all of the 50 US states before I die. There's nothing in, about that goal that determines how I bring it about, right? I could drive, I could fly, I could hitchhike, um, you know, I, whatever. That's irrelevant. And also, this goal is, so it's, the goal is separable from the way in which you accomplish it. It's also separable from you and the way you are. So how I get around 50 states doesn't matter. And it also doesn't matter for achieving that goal whether I'm transformed along the way or not. We'd like to think that if you visit all 50 states, somehow it's going to transform you. But if, if my goal is to visit the 50 states, it's just like, do I visit the 50 states or not? So when Aristotle talks about a telos, it's, it's inseparable from the way in which you arrive at the end. And it's inseparable from what you become in the process of realizing that end. So it's not a goal. Once you really understand what constitutes the you die mon life, a happy life, you'll see that you can't get there by doing something vicious. You can't get there. Like, like there's, a, there's a transportation route that is ruled out. Right? You can only get there by developing and sustaining the virtues because that just is the you die mon life. So it's constituted by becoming a certain kind of person. So Levin sometimes talks about the goal of the good life as though the good life is a means to a separate end, but the good life doesn't have a separate goal. The good life, con con it, the good life constitutes the happy life. It's constituted by living according to the virtues. So that's Aristotle. It's again transformed by the arrival of Christianity. So Lovett's book, is organized in terms of goals, duties, and virtues. Those are, he takes it, three primary forms of moral reasoning. And he wants to map these onto three primary forms of philosophical ethics in the Western tradition. Consequentialism, deontology, or duty-based ethics, and virtue ethics. And he wants to then show how Christian ethics engages in all three of these forms of reflection in a distinctive way. And I agree that you know, Christian ethics is always engaging with existing forms of moral, of moral ethical reflection and transforming them. But the problem is that eudaimonistic ethical reflection, this form of ethical reflection that is, uh, comes from Greek thought and is then transformed by Christian ethical reflection, is just not at all consequentialist in character. So mapping those things together is problematic. So talk of teleological ethics 
like two laws based ethics, uh, suggests that eudaimonistic ethical reflection on what's involved in living well is somehow a close cousin to consequentialism or utilitarianism. Another problematic term that's often used in relationship to both eudaimonistic ethical reflection and consequentialism or utilitarianism is happiness. And Levin does talk about the, the easy misunderstandings that creep in here, and I just want to underscore this. So this Greek term eudaimonia is commonly translated as happiness. Sometimes it's translated flourishing. It just doesn't mean what we typically mean in English by happiness. So it's just important to get very clear on that. We don't usually think in our context of happiness as being conceptually tied or necessarily tied to living well or living virtuously, uh, to being a good human being. So like you could be a good human being and be deeply unhappy in the way that we use the term happiness because we tend to see happiness as a matter of subjective satisfaction, as a matter of whether you're feeling good or not. And the Greeks just didn't think that living well necessarily had to feel good. So why do we think of happiness the way that we do, that we, that we tend to think of it today? Basically because of the impact of utilitarianism that has so deeply shaped the way in which we think about happiness. So if we think about, happy, about ethics as the project of bringing about the greatest happiness for the greatest number, and that's the, the basic uh, utilitarian approach, then we're not thinking uh, typically of trying to bring it about that people live well or that people are perfected as, as the kind of creatures that they are. Then we're somehow thinking about happiness as people's subjective satisfaction, as people getting what they want. Like maximize the greatest happiness for the greatest number. People are, the most people possible are getting what they want. So we need to be constantly reminding ourselves when we read happiness in someone like Augustine, this is not our happiness that he's talking about. All right, so early Christian thinkers, including Augustine, often portray Christianity quite explicitly as a competing philosophical school. They're living in this, in this world of, of s some agreement about what the work of moral philosophy is and that it's not just a set of doctrines and theories, it's a whole way of life. It's an answer to the question of how to live well. And so they found it quite natural to say, okay, there's this array of options on offer and Christianity is the right answer to this question. Hence, it is, it's a philosophical school, but it's also a way of life because, of, because a philosophical school was a way of life. So we find Augustine trying to situate Christianity in relationship to these competing schools by trying to articulate what Christians understood to be the truly happy, the truly eudaimon life, the well of life, the life worth living. So Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, seemed to provide two competing answers himself. You know, the competing schools out there, and then he himself seems to provide two different answers. Um, and so there's still ongoing debate about which one he really endorses or how they fit together. So on the one hand, the eudaimon life is the life that actively expresses the virtues. You're out there in the world and you're being courageous, you're being temperate, you're being just, you're being practically wise, generous, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, the eudaimon life is the life of philosophical contemplation. You're thinking about the highest thing. So Christian thinkers took over this tension. Are we called to the active life? Are we called to the contemplative life? But of course, developing it in Christian ethical ways. So the life of virtue and the life of contemplation were both in some way taken to be the truly happy life. But the object of contemplation for Christians is not, oh, let's just engage in philosophy, and that's what contemplation is. Or it's not, let's think about Plato's form of the good, and that's what contemplation is. Or you know, maybe it's Aristotle's unmoved mover, and that's what contemplation is all about. Rather, the object of contemplation is the God revealed in Jesus Christ, and all that means, right, for who God is, who's, what the identity of God is, 
And then the virtues, the active virtues, are the virtues that are expressed in the life of Christ, revealed in the life of Christ, most prominently on the cross. What does the cross tell us about what the, act, what the life of active virtue consists in? And obviously, this attempt to think about the exemplarity of Jesus on the cross, something we already started discussing last week, right? going back to the, the, uh, the, the New Testament ethic of exemplarity. So Paul, as, as early as Paul, we see talk about the foolishness of the cross as true wisdom. It's a way of, of, of like putting it in your face that this is turning Greek philosophy upside down in terms of what the true, truly wise life is. So this is an ongoing conversation with ancient pagan thought. It's not just changing the subject, right? Then they, they are in conversation. They're, they're discussing, well, what is contemplation? What is the act of life? How do they fit together? But in some sense, it's new wine into old wineskins, right? So it, it is a deep transformation. So to this day, you'll have scholars debating, is Augustine a eudaimonist or is he not a eudaimonist? You know, ongoing debate because it's such a radical transformation. I noted that Aristotle seems to provide two answers to the question of what kind of life is the truly well-lived life, right? whether it's the active exercise of the virtues or whether it's philosophical contemplation. But I want to now underscore that either way he takes this life to be available only to elites. It's available only to elites because the life of active virtue requires that you have means at your disposal. And among the virtues that he discusses, uh, the, the virtue of magnificence, the virtue of being in a position to do great things for your city, to be a public benefactor. That's a virtue, to be a public benefactor. Well, not, not everybody's in a position to do that, to be that, right? So it, it's an elite virtue. It's also elite because you had to have a good upbringing. He thinks if you, if you didn't have a good, good training of your character when you were young, then it's all over for you. And that's a kind of, a, of privilege as well, right? The privilege of a good education. If you didn't have that, too bad. And of course, if we're talking about the life of contemplation, that's available only to elites because he really is thinking about devoting your life to philosophy. Well, who could do that in the ancient world? I mean, who can do that today? Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this does not trouble him. He just does, takes it for granted right? that virtue is, a, is confined to a few. So one of the striking things about, striking differences in the Christian vision of the well-lived life was that Christians did not take the well-lived life to be limited to a privileged few. It was possible to live well in the relevant sense, even if you were poor, even if you were female, even if you were a non-citizen, even if you were a slave, non-Greek. You could live well even if you were martyred. This wasn't just a matter of confidence in a heavenly reward that would compensate for your sufferings. It was a vision that was rooted in the Bible of the happy life as a matter of right relationship with God and neighbor. And it was a vision of being given by God the resources that are needed for living well in this sense. So even more remarkably, one can live well in this sense even if you're fallen and sinful. Because in the most fundamental level, the happy life is a gift, it's not an achievement. It's a matter of grace that's being offered. So given human fallenness, we're incapable on our own of living the life of virtue. So he hammers at pagan philosophy for thinking that it's possible to achieve the happy life. It's just not something that can be achieved. So the most privileged elites and the most poor and the oppressed are fundamentally on a par when it comes to access to the happy life. 
both are going to be utterly reliant on divine grace. So that was central to Augustine's understanding of the happy life and his, his, uh, his understanding in so many ways, right? These in bo both ways bad as well as good, uh, right? We dive into some of, some of what Augustine un understood as the Christian life, um, has this decisive, decisive imprint on later Christian ethical reflection. Augustine was tempted by the life of philosophical contemplation. He spends a part of his time, part of his life, withdrawn, living with a group of friends, like, let's just do philosophy together, and it's going to be great. Um, and he came to see it as a temptation. He becomes the Bishop of Hippo, not very happily, um, but he feels called to live a life of service, so an act of life, right? But it's an act of life in service of contemplation. It's an act of life in service of enabling fellow Christians to live this life of right relationship with God and neighbor in service of putting other, other people in touch with the transformative grace of God. So his primary charge against pagan philosophy, by which he is so deeply influenced, but his primary critique of it as, as prideful, it confuses privilege with merit privilege that makes certain kind of life possible, it sees as an achievement. Philosophers thought that they had achieved the happy life. They thought they deserved the happiness that they had achieved, but the true happiness can't be, uh, true, the true happiness can't be achieved by human effort. Now he will say, so I've, I've said the happy life is, is available to all. I've stressed that it's a matter of right relationship with God and neighbor. I've stressed that it is um, available because it's a gift from God. He does want to say that there's an ultimate happiness that's not available in this life because of the, of the finitude and frailty of worldly existence. And he underscores kind of the miseries of this life. That also is oriented to undermining the pride of the philosophers and to underscoring that fun, fun, you know, the ultimate happiness will be this existence loving God and one another, one another in God in ways that are unhampered by any limitations. So that's why the ultimately happy life is eternal life. It's pointing to a kind of peace, a kind of security in our friendship with God and one another that's not ever fully available in this life. It's not about getting out of our relationships with one another. It's about living into them more, more fully. So one question that arises out of this is, was Christianity then indifferent to fundamental social transformation, indifferent to social justice as understood by, by Augustine? Well, there was a fundamental concern with justice coming out of this concern with right relationship to God and neighbor. And the, the prophets had proclaimed the importance of that, the importance of living that out in everyday life. And Jesus had as well. So to say that you need grace in order to act justly doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility to act justly. <laughs> that responsibility is very much still there, and it's grace that enables one to do that. But it is true that Augustine did not see Christians as tasked with large-scale social transformation. So for example, he, he bemoans the reality of slavery in the ancient world, but he doesn't see Christians as tasked with ending that institution. There were some Christian thinkers at the time who denounced slavery much more strongly than Augustine did. So trying to figure out like why, why did he not, why did he not denounce it? He essentially sees it as a punishment for sin and accepts it as a punishment for sin. Yeah. But more broadly, even the Christians who denounced slavery didn't at that time envision the possibility that Christians would transform the ancient world and bring about the end of the, the social institution of slavery. Really that notion that Christians have a, a, a responsibility for institutional transformation, that is a product of the early modern period, 
we begin to see that in reformed political thought. The idea that we are going to bring the whole world into line with God's will. Augustine sees Christians working much more on the level of individual responsibility to live justly within the parameters of an unjust world, of a fallen world. So that's a fundamental historical shift that is off on the horizon for Augustine. He sees divine agency, not human agency, as fundamentally bringing about that kind of transformation. Human beings might at best act as divine instruments for that social transformation, but they don't control world historical events. So for Augustine, Christians are living in the saculum. Christians are living in a time of waiting for that divine agency to come into the world and fully transform it in light of God's will to bring about ultimate justice. So this, the decisive event of history has happened in Christ's coming, but Christ's reign remains hidden. So as we discussed in week one, Augustine uses the image of the two cities in order to make sense of this situation. And it can be tempting to think of Rome as the earthly city. Rome is indicted for its pagan refusal to worship the true God. Um, and it's then tempting to think of the church as the heavenly city. But the heavenly city for Augustine is the new creation. So it's not to be identified with the church. The church is this finite, fallen entity in pilgrimage on the way. And that, that lends a kind of dynamism to Christian ethical reflection. There's, there's no one is fully in possession of goodness and truth, but always reaching toward it. In the earthly city as well, God may be working in hidden ways. And so there's kind of a question mark placed over against wholesale denunciation. Also a question mark placed against the activities of the church. The church too may be subject to judgment. The wheat and the tares are mixed together. So Augustine understands this heavenly city in, in the form of the church as only being on pilgrimage, being on pilgrimage to a fully realized eternal life of loving God and loving one another in God. Well, how does that pilgrimage take place fundamentally? Right? How, how can you know, how, how do you experience that movement toward God? And Augustine has sometimes been seen as understanding that pilgrimage fundamentally in terms of Neoplatonic ascent, a notion that the ultimate good is this transcendent good that we drawn near to through ridding ourselves of attachment to this, to this life. We're going to ascend by way of contemplation. And thus loving God means giving up on all other loves, detaching ourselves from all other attachments. And Augustine makes a distinction between uti and frui, saying that only God is to be enjoyed, fruition, fruitio is only for God, and all other goods are to be used. That has reinforced this perception that the ascent, that we ascend, we draw near to God, we, our pilgrimage takes place through giving up all other loves or reusing all other goods just to get to God. Only God is to be savored, only God is to be enjoyed. And there is something to this in terms of what Augustine thinks at the beginning of his own personal voyage of transformation. But he grew out of this early tendency to think of love of God as in a zero-sum competition with love of other people or love of, love of other goods. There is a nearly obsolete meaning of the word use in English that comes closer to what Augustine means when he contrasts uti and frui. How one uses someone is a matter of how one treats someone, according to this nearly obsolete meaning of, of, of the word. So she used him well, means she treated him well, she treated him appropriately. 
So we can sometimes use, uh, sometimes remind ourselves of that nearly obsolete meaning of use in English to get at what Augustine has in mind here, which is that everything and everyone that is not God is treated well, appropriately, used well, right, in that sense, when it is loved in relationship to God. So loving God orders all of our loves. Or loving God enables us to love everything and everyone else well. What we tend to do is to love everything and everyone in relationship to our own <coughs> sinful desires, our own selfish desires. We, des we love other things and other people in relationship to our narrow construal of what's worth wanting. So when we come to love God, Augustine thinks, there's this transformation that takes place. We don't stop loving everything else. And we don't just use them as a means to get to God, but we love them in new ways. We love them in ways that are in relationship to how God loves them, how God treasures them for their own sake, as opposed to in relationship to what I need and what I want. So that's his fundamental sense of what it means to to love, uh, to, to enjoy God, uh, and to love everything else in relationship to God. And by the end of his career, he's willing to say, we enjoy one another in God. And not, not anymore to say, well, we only use one another. We enjoy one another in God. We don't leave behind those goods of finite reality. So we come back to our case study. Here is Ecdicia. And you already know now. <laughs> he doesn't think it's a good idea to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Can we say more now about why? What, would he, what, what, what is he thinking as he unpacks this set of responsibilities? Yeah. Absolutely. And what might we what might we want to say about what giving what what the sale of all you know giving everything away, what what might she be thinking? How might she be construing what's accomplished by that? Giving away everything to the poor. He might also be concerned that she's thinking, whew, I've done pretty well here, you know? Um, I you know, I am a I'm a heroic Christian. <laughs> I, so this, this notion that she thinks she's loving God ultimately, but is she really in some significant way putting a, her prideful self first? Right? This is kind of self-glorification because she is the heroic Christian who's managed to follow the advice given to the rich young man. And so he's chastening that by saying that, that's a danger to fall into that aspiration to heroic deeds. Your salvation is something you're, you're receiving and that you live out then in, a, in an attitude of love. And that love is going to be an ordering of your, of your responsibilities. Right? There's, there's going to be a kind of transformation and maybe the way in which you hold on to your wealth might, might well be transformed, but not at the expense of leaving behind the finite attachments. They're, they're to be, your husband, your, your, your child um, are to be loved in relationship to how they're treasured as God's, as God's creatures. Right? So Augustine is um, incredibly important for Christian ethics. He's certainly not above critique. I just want to note a few of the respects in which um, He's not exemplary. I've already noted that he can't conceive of Christians taking responsibility for structural transformation of society. He takes life to be full of suffering, and he's looking forward to a heaven in which all those sufferings will be taken away. So it's not, it's not our responsibility to try to do that here and now, we, to bear with these sufferings. While he certainly regards women as capable of important forms of spiritual leadership, and we saw in this particular instance, he doesn't just have a knee-jerk turn to, you know, 
uh, women obey your husbands and like, you can't make these decisions on your own. He certainly doesn't regard as problematic or in need of decisive transformation the ways in which his society regarded women as, as inferior in multiple respects. He takes that for granted. He is um, unhesitating in affirming the goodness of material creation. We have not had an opportunity to unpack how significant that is in his context in which there are schools of thought that denigrate the body um, quite decisively. He's insistent. Resurrection of the body means God has affirmed the goodness of material creation and that will, that will persist into this eternal life of, of, of happiness and communion with God. But while he affirms the goodness of material creation and with it the goodness of the body, he experienced his own sexuality as deeply disruptive, deeply troubling, and we inherit, uh, you know, we, we in the West have, uh, have inherited that deep discomfort with sexuality, which still continues to be something that is work, being worked through in our society. So he thinks that sexual desire was an element of God's good creation, but it's so deeply fallen that it's fundamentally experienced in, in a disruptive, troubling way. And he endorsed the use of force against the Donatus. He endorsed the use of judicial torture. So he has a fundamentally different understanding of how force can be used as, a, as an instrument of God's will, again, in a fallen world. I mean, he's, a, he's not glorifying the use of force, but with regard to the Donatus, he regarded adherence to the faith as a kind of oath of loyalty and that you should, you can help others by coercing them to fulfill their oaths. You can help a sinner by torturing them to reveal a truth that could potentially save their soul. So an imperfect deep influence on Christian ethical reflection. I've primarily em emphasized the positive side. I want to acknowledge, just acknowledge in closing the uh, negative sides um, while also underscoring the fact that, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is just naming things. It's not actually unpacking them in a significant way. To treat Augustine as an authority for Christian ethics is just to treat him as a conversation partner, an ongoing touch point for, for ethical reflection. So that's our responsibility toward Augustine is to draw him into our ongoing conversation. And beyond that, authority, you know, authority is not determining our views. And with that, We'll draw it to close. I will see you on Zoom on Thursday. And I'll send out an announcement too because I, I, I would hate to have somebody come at 9.30 <laughs> and sit here. Thank you.